Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Because He overcame, we have been made more than overcomers. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Nothing is impossible. We've heard it all morning. Nothing is impossible with God. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what may face you tomorrow or in the upcoming days, weeks, or years, but God is more than able to take care of whatever that need might be. In fact, He saw that need long before you ever dreamed it could be. Amen. He saw it before you were ever even born and had already had a plan, amen, through Jesus to deliver you from every evil. Hallelujah. Praise God. Give Him a big hand clap this morning. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Praise God. God bless you. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Thank you, Tim. As always, great job. Amen. Praise the Lord. Suzanne and Tammy, thank you for leading us in worship. Thank all of you for being here this morning, for your testimonies and your, amen, your uh, confessions of faith. Praise the Lord. And your prayer requests. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to say one thing. Sally just reminded me of this. In fact, I <clears throat> had thought about it uh, last night. And then it slipped my mind, and so when Sally mentioned it, because I hadn't told her anything about it to speak of, uh, but when Sally mentioned it to me, then I just felt like that was a witness from the Lord that we need to, I'd like us all to stand for a, a moment again. It's almost like being in Catholic Church here. For a moment. No, no offense against Catholics, like half of my family are. But um, uh, I'd like us to pray for Mike uh, Fox. I got a text from him the other day. I get a text from him usually every week, uh, just basically, you know, telling me what's going on and how he's doing. And I have a lot of details because I don't ask him. I just figure whatever he wants to share, he will. But he's, tr he's uh, in the process of trying to get uh, permission to go to church, not necessarily this church. I'm just saying everybody should be able to go to church. Yes. Yeah. Uh, where else are you going to go and get what he needs and what everybody else needs, regardless of what your feelings are about the whole thing? Uh, he says he doesn't know how they're going to do it, if he'll have to have a monitor or what, but I don't care how any of that works out. I, I'd just like to see him to be able to be in the house of God somewhere Amen. and uh, be with believers. And I, it's important, you know. And uh, regardless of what you feel about him personally or what you think, it's, I don't care. I, I'm not really that interested. Uh, God knows and knew, and he's, he's still a soul. He's still somebody that's important to God. And, and I think for that reason, I, I think we should come together here and pray and believe that God will open a door for him to be able to be in the house of the Lord somewhere where he can be fed, where he can interact with other believers, amen, and experience all that God has for him as well, amen. So let's just agree together right now. Father, we just thank you. We know, Lord, that your love isn't affected by our actions and our behaviors. We may dislike a lot of things, but that's irrelevant as far as you're concerned. Everybody needs to be able to come into the presence of the Lord with a body of believers, with a community of people that believe, that have faith, that you may be able to do a work in His life in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just ask you to open that door. Make it possible, Lord, that He can worship you with people of like faith to lift you up and to magnify you in spite of all of the problems and the issues and the failures that we have. Lord, I know that you desire his praise. You desire him to be part of a community of believers. And we ask you, Lord, to do that in Jesus' name. And we give you the thanks and the praise for it right now in Jesus' name. And everybody say praise the Lord. God bless you again. Please be seated. Thank the Lord. I was going to ask you that too. Anything you wanted to say about uh, the upcoming clothing giveaway here next week? Any, anything you have to? This, 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 this Saturday from 10 to 2, um, anything you want to put on the hill, you're welcome. You will be fed. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Powerful incentive right there. Glory to God. Right. Praise the Lord. So if you have anything you want to bring to contribute, please do. Uh, if you can help out, maybe not necessarily have to be here for the full, full four hours, but if you can come to 
for an hour or whatever, anybody and everybody that can, uh, it'll be a good thing. Praise the Lord. We're trying to be a blessing. Yvette yes. felt led of the Lord to do this, and, and I, how can you disagree? God wants to bless people and help people, and this is an opportunity for us to do this on a, in a way that yeah, maybe only we can do it right here in this community. So yeah, yeah. If, you, if you can help out, please do, Suzanne. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Don. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, if we, if we dig into sin, just to the people that are here, God only knows. Oh, yeah. I yeah, think. absolutely. So, I'm speaking for myself. If Mike wanted to come back and yeah. be part of our congregation... It certainly would not offend me at all. I know. In I, fact, I believe Jesus said, "He who is without sin, yeah. you you throw the first right. chuck, the first stone." And I don't think any of us can throw. It. No, I, I've had the, I've had a lot of thoughts. I, I haven't really gone into a lot of that with Mike, other than just that we're praying that we want to see him restored, and mm -hmm. and I understand the pain and other people that have been hurt and so on and so forth. But I mean, what God has said to me. And it would be up to y'all anyway. I mean, I'm not going to just make a decision and force it down your throat. But the truth is, this is really what church is about. I mean, I think we'd be the, the epitome of hypocrites if we denied. I mean, I, I mean, I just, that's all I can say. But I would like you to pray about it. I don't know. You know, like I said, I don't know what, uh, how, how this will go forward. But my main focus right now in, in terms of Mike is that, that he could go to church somewhere. Yeah. And then, you know, we can take it from there as yeah. we go down the road. But you now I just, how do you live in this world without, yeah. Yeah. you know, some kind of connection there? And so, anyway, that's my hope and my prayer. And uh, we'll, we'll just be believing God and yeah. see where God goes with it. I, yep. To me, this is God saying, okay, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you want to preach grace, you want to talk about the love of God, the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace of God, then... How about when it comes to your doorstep? You know, how do you want to deal with it? So, praise the Lord. All right, so God bless y'all. Appreciate you being here. Beautiful day yesterday. It sounds like this, at least tomorrow, is going to be really good too. Um, we were all day at a wedding and, re you know, pictures and reception and everything yesterday from about 2 o'clock till 7 o'clock last night. Some lasted even longer. Praise the Lord. They look a little blurry-eyed this morning. It's because... Hey, we're at the reception longer than us. But anyway, it was all good. Great time. We got to see another granddaughter. Uh, married, beautiful couple. Love the Lord. It's just, it's great. Just love those things. Praise the Lord. So uh, next Saturday, we got a, another grandkid. Only this one's a birthday. You know, when you, Don, most of you, you all know that if you've got a very big family, this stuff never ends. It's not like, you know, you're going to get a weekend off. Somebody's got a birthday or a wedding anniversary or something every day because it's just the way it is. Praise the Lord. But we'll never be bored. We'll never get worn out of, with just sitting around and have nothing to do. Praise the Lord. But anyway, it's all great. Appreciate the Lord uh, blessing that young couple. And we're excited for their future and, and more great grandkids down the road. Because that is what happens. Familiarity not only breeds contempt, but kids. Praise the Lord. So, praise God. I, I was just going to share something with you. You know, during World War II, there were uh, these captured Allied agents in a prison camp in Germany, and uh, they were attempting another one of these daring escapes. You know, we've all seen these escape movies, but this was a deal going on back during World War II. And so, on this particular night, uh, Major O'Rourke and Lieutenant Flanagan were chosen to uh, try to file through the bars in their stockade so that they could escape. And they were hard at work when the sirens sounded and floodlights caught them right in the middle of the act. And as the German officers led them away, O'Rourke said, we were so careful, how did you catch us? And the German replied, simple, somehow I can always tell when Irish spies are filing. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Glory to God. You know, it's tax time. In fact, we just filed our tax a couple weeks ago, and we didn't send the money in yet, but praise the Lord. We always wait till the last minute to do that, because I'm not giving them any interest off of my money. Hallelujah. Anyhow, it's, I've just discovered over the years it takes a lot of money to live in a free country. Yeah, hallelujah. You get together with family. We were really, I, as a kid, we were in a big family, but we were really spoiled as kids. My mom, every meal, she'd give us a menu with two choices. Take it or leave it. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Now, before I move on to the human side of this thing, I'll just give you a little animal information. <coughs> Grizzlies can be overbearing. A crazy female deer, a weirdo. <laughs> or how about an Australian mystic, kangaroo? <laughs> That's about all anybody can take for one morning, praise the Lord. We'll move on. Glory to God. All right, praise the Lord. God's in a good mood, hallelujah, all the time. And so I'm going to have quite a few scriptures here at the beginning because I want to, so I don't have to stop too many times during the message. Uh, we'll still have some scriptures to deal with, but I'll get some of them up front here, and that will give us a little time to kind of concentrate on the, on the Word of God. So the scripture tells us that by grace, through faith, we receive healing, prosperity, deliverance, whatever the need is that God has provided for us. The provision was made over 2,000 years ago, actually before the foundation of the world in Christ. So it's already done. It's a question of it being manifest into our lives or it being realized, okay? So manifestation is the glory of God. When we see a miracle, when we, what we call a miracle, or when we see signs and wonders or a prayer answered or some, you know, situation that's unnatural, that's not just a natural thing, that was accomplished long ago. It just manifests because we believe it, because we confess it, because we act on it, right? That manifestation is the glory of God, and the Scripture tells us it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, which again solidifies this idea of it already being done. If you've got Jesus in you, you've got the finished work. You have your inheritance, which is everything that you have need of or could have need of. Amen? So with that in mind, let's look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, Suzanne. Romans 5 and verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So he says, okay, how do we have access? We also have access by faith into this grace, into this free gift wherein we stand which is in Christ, saved, healed, delivered, prospered, all that. And we rejoice in the hope of the manifestation of all these things that we would have need of. Amen? All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. 2 Peter 1, verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. See, basically just what we were saying, grace and peace is multiplied or, or uh, increased in us or to us through our understanding or our knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life, has, hath given us, is past tense, so we know we already have it, Unto us, all things, all the things have already been taken care of that pertain to life and to godliness. So, income, yes. you know, uh, house, a roof over your head, you know, and healing and deliver all things yes. that pertain to life, just the normal living that we got to go through, and godliness, yes. the supernatural side of it as well. Because the truth is, nothing... You can't get anything here in the natural that hasn't already been yes. dealt with in the spiritual. Right. Praise the Lord. So that's what he's talking about. Pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him 
that has called us to what? The manifestation, the glory, the, the healings, the deliverance, the, the prosperity, everything, and virtue. Yeah. Praise God. All right. Now we're going to get three more, three more scriptures here, and they're going to get a little lengthy. But again, I want to get, I try to suck it in, you know, and just hang on to it because it'll open up as we go along. All right. So let's begin here with Matthew chapter 7, 9 through 12. Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. Whoso curseth his father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, If a man shall say to his father, This is not the scripture I want. Did I give you the right one? 7, chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. Here we go. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? This is all what Tim was talking about, everything that was kind of being shared here before, prior to the uh, worship. Uh, what man is there of you whom, if his son asks a bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So just think. When Tim was sharing that, we all can relate to that. We feel the same way about our grandkids. It's when they're small, you want to hold them, you want to love them, you want to just, every little thing they do is a new thing, you know? And it's, it's exciting. But see, God feels the same way about us. I mean, in, 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 the, in the reality of God, we are little children. We are just these infants, you know? And so how, if you do feel that way about yours, and you're just fleshly loving and so on and so forth, how much more this God, this perfect love called God, yeah. how must he feel towards us? Amen? Give good things to them that ask. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you now. Now he's saying, but there's a caveat here. Right? He's saying, whatever you want, it's, it's there for you. It's provided for you. You, you have access to it. And then he goes on, and because of that, or therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So you, you just lost any argument you might have had, amen, about whether or not we're going to reach out to people that are screwed up. Because the fact is, everybody's screwed up. It's just what they're screwed up with. So if you then being evil, all right, therefore all things whatsoever you would do, men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Romans, chap, Romans excuse me, chapter 12, verses 3 through 21. That's from 3 all the way through to the end of the chapter, Suzanne. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth and on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and not curse, or curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Not, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, 
live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Praise the Lord. We read these things all the time, but how much do we really... How much weight do we really apply to it? Because we have our own agenda. And when we get crossed sideways, we want revenge, restitution, something, you know. Praise the Lord. I believe in the grace of God. I believe that God has a plan to bless us beyond our wildest dreams. But there are some things that he expects of us, too. Not as prerequisites for his love or for his forgiveness, but for our ability to move forward and be Christ-like, to do the works of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying this is all enjoyable. I'm not saying it's going to give you goosebumps and make you feel all giddy. But it is the thing we have to do. There are some disciplines, amen, in Christianity. And one of them is to overcome your own flesh. Praise the Lord. All right. John chapter 1, verse 38 through 46. John 1, 38 through 46. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Praise the Lord. So how many of you have heard of Megiddo? Yeah, well, it was situated in the uh, northern hills of Israel along the Jezreel Valley. It's the place where it's uh, prophesied that this great end time battle of Armageddon would take place. Now in the ancient world, Megiddo had a strategic importance. It sat right along the, what they call the Via Maris or the Way of the Sea. It was a major trade route on the Mediterranean Sea. It was crossed by other trade routes that uh, allowed people to travel between Africa and Europe and Asia. And whoever conquered Megiddo had control over trade in the known world at that time. Whoever controlled trade controlled the economy. Whoever controlled the economy controlled the world. Praise the Lord. So because of that, Megiddo becomes one of the most fought over cities in the ancient world. Battle after battle after battle took place there because of its strategic position. Amen. Now, archaeologists have discovered at least 26 layers of civilization there. Imagine that. This doesn't happen in 40 years. You don't get a layer of civilization. I mean, it takes hundreds of years before you actually have this. So 26 layers. Just 11 miles across the Jezreel Valley and within eyesight from Megiddo is another city. But unlike Megiddo, this city today is one of the most well-known or familiar towns in the world. It's called Nazareth, the boyhood town of Jesus. But in ancient times, Nazareth wasn't fought over. It wasn't desired. It wasn't even talked about. It was a small town with a few hundred people in it. 
It wasn't mentioned in Jewish literature until the third century AD. It wasn't even talked about in Jewish literature for 300 years after Jesus. So it's no wonder that Nathaniel was dumbfounded when Philip told him that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah. He's thinking, Cut, really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and it shouldn't surprise us that people that God uses aren't the ones we see as important. They don't come from where we expect. And they may not look significant. The paradox or the contradiction of Nazareth is just another reminder of the paradox or the contradiction of the heavenly kingdom as opposed to the kingdoms of this world. God was saying more than just my son's going to be raised up here. He's telling us how it is for everybody in his kingdom in his way of operating, in his way of thinking. Amen? God's ways flip the ways of our cultures and our worlds, and he turns them on their head. That's why the carnal mind is enmity with God, because the carnal mind would tell you, well, Jesus surely is going to come out of Jerusalem, or he'll come from Megiddo or someplace where everybody has their focus. Amen? But here's the deal. At the center of God's will for my life is this subtle self-deception that life is really about me. Praise the Lord. Religiously, we think God's will for individual lives is to write us into his story as a central character. Praise the Lord. Whether we're aware of it or not, there's this subtle sense that we should be in the driver's seat. We want to write God into our story. Right. Yeah. But God prefers writing us into his. He loves us all. There's no deviation in God's affection for one Christian over another. He doesn't do something for Sally that he wouldn't do for Don. He doesn't do something for Debbie that he wouldn't do for John. It's just not, it's not the way God is. Amen? Praise the Lord. What about God's calling for our lives? You know, what's our purpose? How does God want me or you or us to use the gifts that he's told us, that we read, that he's given to us by the Spirit? Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Suzanne. Romans 12 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So the question isn't simply, uh, what will make me happy? I mean, I want to be happy. But that really isn't the apex you know, or the acme of what God's trying to do in our lives. The more complex question of what is good, true, and beautiful that I'm supposed to be focusing on. Mm -hmm. What promise has God made that I can have peace in? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a powerful thing. We mentioned it here earlier, too. To see or hear God say, I will. There's nothing like it when it happens, whether it's a healing, whether it's a deliverance, whatever. Whatever it is you're looking for, whatever it is you're seeking, amen. When God says, I will, it's life changing. Yes. Praise the Lord. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. <clears throat> Be not conformed to this world. Okay, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 says, I will make of thee, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Think that wasn't a life changing thing for yeah. Abraham? Praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm yes. and with great judgments. Praise the Lord. Mark chapter 14, verse 58. <clears throat> Verse 
We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. I will. Praise the Lord. John 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Praise the Lord. So God's promises are backed by the declaration of His power, amen, and His intention to act. I mean, He has intentions. He wants to act on these things. Praise God. And we can trust Him in everything and rely on His power at work in the world and in our lives because He said so. Yes. I will. Yes. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1, verses 11 and 12. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Amen. So how to find our path. I, you know, I'm talking to people on the phone during the week, and you think, well, a small church, it probably that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. It happens almost every day. Sometimes multiple times a day. And I'm not complaining. That just goes with the territory. But I'm saying some of the things that I deal with on the telephone are just, it's just a, a question of not believing. Yeah. And I'm not saying there aren't reasons naturally sure. to not believe or to question. Yeah. Right. But I'm saying we can't operate from that place. Right. Or you'll never get any more than the natural. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So how do we find this path? How do we find our path? our way? How do we find the answer to our questions that are regarding uh, God's will, right. amen, without giving in to the idea that God has like seven billion wills? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Praise the Lord. Right. I mean, maybe it's that God's singular will is big enough to fit seven billion people. Yeah. 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 Now, I'm not saying there, there is a specific will but that specific will for your life will never be found without the general will of God. You can't bypass it. It's not just about you. But everything He's promised is yours. But there's a general will that we have to follow in order to get to the specific will. And what we do a lot of times as humans is we would leapfrog over the general will and just want to get the specific will. General will being love your brother. You love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have others do unto them. That's a general rule. And you can't get to the specific rule if you're not going to go with the general rule. If you're going to hate everybody and backstab them and, and, and get even with them because of something they did to you, don't think you can leap that, leapfrog that and go right to my healing or my deliverance or my prosperity because it doesn't work that way. It isn't God withholding from you. He's saying there's a path here and you've got to get on the path. The path is the same for 7 billion people for every person on this planet. That path is the same. But each one of us, there are little specific things that are going on in our life that God wants to work on. But He can't get to those if we don't follow the general. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, a lot of times God answers the bigger questions through a series of smaller questions and actions. You ever have something hanging, you know, that you're just trying to get the, find direction, find a purpose, find a way, find something. What does God, how does God want me to do that? And there will be little things will come up or little questions that seem to have nothing to do with this big issue. But the more you think about the little questions and the more you look at the little things that are happening around it, the more you realize this is the way I'm supposed to be going. I've, been, I've made it about this big thing, and God's saying, look at all these little things are pointing you right to the way you should go. There's this, these general things that are pointing you in the direction of the specific or the big thing that God's trying to do in each of our lives, whatever it might be. Amen? Glory to God. Sometimes the more relevant question is not, God, what is your specific will for my life? But God, help me understand what decision to make today. Faith isn't just a commitment to the future. But it's about choices in the moment. Because your future is based on the choice you make today. Yes. Amen. What's going to happen tomorrow will be based on multiple decisions that we make today. Exactly. So instead of asking God for the big deal, maybe I should be asking him, how should I deal with this person that's yeah. just rubbing me the wrong way all the time? Or how, how should I deal with this, this need for some financial assistance? Or how should I deal with this 
sense of just being overwhelmed with stress or how, how, what do I, how do I deal with just feeling like, man, I just can't take any more of this. I need a break. I got to get away. I got to give, just give me some breathing room here. Amen. Yep. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah. See, it wasn't a place of prominence yet. It was where God birthed his vision for salvation Jesus. for the whole picture. Yeah. Amen. No one could have foreseen it. But in so many ways, if you look back at it, it's consistent with every other part of God's saving work. Unexpected. Unusual. For while you were yet sinners, he died for you. That doesn't make it. Well, it ought to be after we got our act together, after we got cleaned up and straightened up and got rid of all of our problems. He dies for it. No. It's just the opposite of what you would think naturally. It's while we were still all screwed up and weren't even looking for him. Weren't interested in him. Like Mr. Bell. That Jesus died for him. Yes. And Jesus is not going to let that guy go. No. I mean, I believe that. He's going to keep yeah. coming in any way and every way he can. Now, you might think, Don, I, I, I was listening to what you said. And we've all kind of had these experiences with people that are, you know, they're good people, but they just, they don't want religion. They just don't want, they don't understand it. And, but here's the deal. The very fact that you asked, and she had to say No. Put a seed yeah. in their head. Yes. Did, was that a good choice? I mean, did I make it? Maybe we could have just, you know, and maybe we're a little uncomfortable with other people talking about religion because we've kind of had some in charge stuff. Yeah. You know, you're running a company and, and you're the head of a family and, and, you know, you get used to making decisions. Yeah. And you get used to trusting in the decisions you make or else you're worthless in your capacity. And here comes somebody trying to tell me that they know something I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it may not be, you know, intellectually an affront, but something inside says, yeah. what, do they, what do they know that I don't know? Yeah. I've been hearing this stuff all my life, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, a seed was planted yeah. even in the rejection. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Yeah. And God can use it. Yeah. What they meant for evil, He can use for good. Yeah. Praise God. God just, it just seems to me that he's always turning the categories of this world or the priorities of this world on their head. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Jesus was the picture of an insider come from heaven, come from God himself, amen, becoming an outsider. And he flips the category so that we as outsiders yes. away from God yeah. without God and lost in the world become one with God mm -hmm. become insiders yes. just the opposite of what the world would tell you well if you get cleaned up and do all the right stuff you're supposed to do and behave yourself then there's a chance you could get in you might get accepted Groucho Marx used to say and I love this he said that he was Jewish and they wouldn't let him join any of the golf clubs or anything there in Southern California and they said doesn't that bother you and he said are you kidding any club that would have me as a member I don't want any part of yeah. <laughs> you think about that sometimes with the Lord yeah. you know if heaven's full of people like me I'm a little uncomfortable yeah. praise the Lord but we're not up we're not what we think we are yeah. praise the Lord Glory to God. When we surrender our plans to God, we find out that we're successful. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. There's no, there's no formula, there's no universal pattern for the calling in a Christian's life. I've known a lot of people, it isn't, we're not just talking about the calling of the ministry, but the calling that God has for your life, the purpose, the people you'll interact with, all the things that He has for you. Amen? There isn't a three-step program to figure this thing out. There isn't a formula. It's different for everybody. Now, he wants it for all seven billion. But for each one of us, because we are unique, again, like to what Tim said, our personalities are all different within a family. You can have the extremes, and you wonder, where in the heck did that kid come from? You know, I mean, it's just unlike the rest of them. Or the others, each one has their, their uniqueness and their... their 
uh, you know, singularity of personality and so forth. And God knew that. He designed us that way because yes. every one of us are going to live a different life. Even though we're a part of a family, we yes. still got our own ways we got to go. Amen? And it's true with the family of God. We are all a part of that family. We are all in Christ. But each of our lives have little different ways that we go. Jobs that we have. Yeah. In circle of influence. People that we know. Yeah. Lives that we touch. And t lives that will touch ours. Amen? So what, what we're promised is that God is faithful. Yes. Amen? And He gave the Holy Spirit specifically... Amen. To give us guidance, to lead us, amen, and give us input from God. Praise the Lord. So here's a quote by, uh, I, I've quoted this guy quite a bit, Kierkegaard. And uh, he says, to dare is to lose one's footing momentarily. Not to dare is to lose oneself. I find that profound. That, that's powerful. To take a chance is to risk being unstable for a little bit. Right, yeah. To not take that risk yeah. is to be completely yep. out of it. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. yeah. Having no impact, having no effect at all. Right. Pursuing, pursuing your call, pursuing the path that God has for your life is a big risk. Yep. Yeah, it is. Our ideal is that everything would just be perfect. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. If you don't ever take any risks, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the old cliche, uh, I'm going to shoot the moon, hit the moon, you know. Well, you might miss, but if you don't aim, yep. you're not going to hit anything. I mean, if you don't take, make an effort, right. praise the Lord, nothing's going to happen. Right. It's better to have tried, you know, the old love and lost, it's better to have tried and failed to than never have tried at all because the day is going to come when you're going to, I wonder what would have happened yeah. if, yes. what if, how yes. if, you know, all those kind of questions, amen, that we, that we ask ourselves, praise the Lord, amen. So, pursuing our call is a risk, but the idea of God's bigness and the bigness of his plans have to grow in order for us to do that. Now, if you're not, if, if, if you don't ever take a risk, don't talk to me about faith. I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying you've got to get out of the comfort zone in order for God to operate in your life. Now, am I telling you you've got to take a risk? No, I'm not telling you anything at all. I'm just saying don't complain to me about the risk. I'm not, I'm not an actuary. You know, I don't work for the insurance company. I'm not measuring risks. Because your risk probably isn't a big deal to me. Because right. yeah. I'm not risking anything. Right? right. Yeah. right? right. It's only when i got to risk something right. that it becomes important. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Praise God. So we, we have to learn, amen, that God is bigger than my risk. Yeah. And I'll never know how God how big God is and how much God wants to do and how much God will do in my life if I don't take the risk. Right. Right. Praise the Lord. You cannot risk anything and go to heaven. But you're going to be living just like everybody else here on earth that's not going to heaven. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. But you see, you can't go to somebody... I can't go, I can't go to Jane and say, Jane, should I... Should I just uh, quit the ministry and, and go to the, the foreign field? You know, go become a missionary. I'm not thinking about this. I'm just using it as an example. Jane can't tell me. Yeah. She could only tell me what she would do if God was telling, talking to her about it. But God's not talking to her about it. Right. So I'm looking for an answer from somebody who doesn't have the answer. Right. If God's talking to me, I need to be talking to God about this thing and not to Jane. You understand? There's nothing against Jane. I'm just saying, we, don't, we can't feel what other people feel. We don't have the same desire. We don't have the same burden. Right. All right, how come, how come I didn't have a clothes uh, shop? Because I didn't have a burden for one. The last person that had it moved on to another church. Yeah. And then we had a flood, and we just hauled everything out and said, that's enough of that. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Right? Until God comes along and repeats himself yeah. with somebody else. His, his idea hadn't changed any. 
It was our ideas that changed. My priorities changed, not God's. He had to bring somebody else that he had spoken to about this because I had become so numb to it. Right? When I heard it, I just thought of the negative side of it. The cleanup. The, the work might be hauled in and hauled out along with the clothes. <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, so I'm just saying, you know, that's the way it is. You, you can't expect somebody else to give you the answer right. to your risk. Right. Only you know. Right. Praise the Lord. As Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And a man by the name of Bonhoeffer wrote this. He said, Christian life is not an ideal we have to realize. Now listen to this. A, the Christian life is not an ideal that we have to realize, but rather it is a reality created by God in Christ that we get to participate in. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not something we actualize ourselves. It's something we just step into yes. and operate, amen, based on what God has already said. Yes. Yes. See, I've heard it said that we, we see Jesus a lot like we see Elvis. <laughs> we love the man, but his fan club scares the hell out of us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Praise the Lord. So some people seem to be asking, can't I just have Jesus and not the institution? Can't I just have Jesus and not the community? Can't I have Jesus and not the church? Can't we just hang out with Elvis back in the green room and not have to spend time with his crazy fan club? <laughs> Though it seems obvious based on that, that we could just hang out with Jesus without all of you, without the followers. Right? But the gospel seems to say we can't have Jesus without his people. Yes. Messy as they are, yes. it's a package deal. Yes. The question is do we really need the church? Yes. If church is a big problem, if it's such an issue for so many people, surely there must be a better solution. Listen, don't think that I don't think these things because I'm looking out here at the numbers. I've seen it up and down. And, and you wonder sometimes, is this really even necessary? Are, are we just spinning our wheels or can we just go home and huddle around the fireplace with the Bible and yeah. it's all good? I mean, isn't the end game after all simply my own personal relationship with God and doing His will? Well, people say, I'm the church, right? I could just be with myself at home. I could, with a couple of people, get together. It's church. No, it's, it's a Bible study. It's a meeting of some kind, but it's not church. Look at, uh, look at Matthew 18, 20. This is a scripture that I've heard over and over and over through the years. You don't need a church. You don't need the institution. You don't need the community of the church. Wherever two or three are gathered... Amen. There I am. That's not talking about the church. Yeah. It's where we take stuff out of context and then try to apply it to some right. end decision that we've already made right. and want to fit God into this plan. Right. right? So, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's not church. It's not about the gathering, amen, of believers at all. It's actually just by ourselves, just me alone, I can... I can carry the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I do. You do if you're born again, right? Do. And I can commune with God yeah. all by myself yeah. and do. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have to gather together for that to happen, right? I'm just being honest. We don't have to gather together for me to be able to communicate with God and for God to communicate to me right. or for you individually. Amen. Hallelujah. Here... What Jesus is actually speaking of is the process of how to resolve interpersonal issues. Conflicts within the body. So I got a deal. Oh, you could talk about Mike. You could talk about God. Uh, there's a plethora of, I mean, I could go back over the 35 years of ministry and tell you just yeah. all kinds of stuff. And you know yourself, you've dealt with it too, right? 
Jesus wasn't talking, this wasn't talking about a church service. It was talking about some people that were believers that had issues with each other. Somebody said something, somebody did something, somebody took something, somebody had an attitude, somebody did whatever, and Jesus said, here's the way to deal with it. You get together, two or three people, and you discuss this issue and come to a resolution. Amen? In other words, he's, he's speaking of the process of how to resolve these interpersonal conflicts within the church, within the body of believers. Amen? And he's, he's referring to the Old Testament legal system because that's where they were when Jesus said this, amen, calling for a group of friends to come together and resolve any conflicts within the believers. Yeah. Amen. Look at this, for example, uh, Deuteronomy 19, uh, chapter 19, verses 15 through 17. But you can, there's several places in Deuteronomy it talks about this. The book of Numbers is filled with it. How to deal with personal issues and conflicts within the believers. So it's not talking about two or three people get together in a phone booth somewhere and that's church. That's not church. It's two or three people trying to work through some things or whatever it might be, but that isn't what he calls church. So one witness shall not rise up against many for in any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. He's trying to tell them how to work through stuff. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. Praise the Lord. So that's what Jesus was referring to. He wasn't talking about a church service. The ecclesia or ecclesiastia is translated church in the New Testament 114 times. The called out ones are identified as a community of believers, 114 times in the New Testament. 90 times they're referred to as the local assembly. That's the church. The church is a visible, active community gathering together. An actual, literal assembly that God designed us to participate in. This isn't just a whim. It isn't just something we made up religiously. This was God's design. So one of the reasons, my feeling is, one of the reasons the church isn't as impacting and as effective as it should be is because half of it isn't there. Yeah. Yeah. So if some are prophets and some are uh, healing and some are this and some are that, and they're not the same every day because we all have the same gifts and the gifts are there for the need that's before us. So if, if you've got, if Don needs healing, I don't need the gift of prophecy. I need the gift of healing to be in operation. That's the point. So that we're all different members but have purposes and so on and so forth. That we have to have one another to complete. Otherwise, we are a, a head with this maimed body. And the head, how many of you know, if you don't have any arms, no matter how many times you think about picking up this Bible, you ain't picking it up. You can think it all you want to, but it's not going to happen without a hand to do it. Praise the Lord. So the church is a visible, active community. Amen. They gather together, and this, it's a literal assembly that God determined should be. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 and 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular... And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps governments, diversities of tongues. Praise the Lord. So to talk, this is like to talk about the life of faith in a vacuum, as though it were just between God and me, is the equivalent to saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And just stop. But that isn't the end of it. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. The disciples ask him, who's my neighbor? Yeah. Right? Because we don't want to be wasting this. Just, just the neighbor. Everybody, any human being is a neighbor. They're on planet Earth. That's a neighbor. Praise God. So, I love God. By loving others. Yes. And God at the same time. Because yes. how am I going to love God 
except by loving somebody. Right? I mean, I can't get my arms around him. I can say it all I want to. But the only way I can really act, amen, for God to see my actions is to love you. Praise the Lord. By loving you, in that one action, I love God. Yes. By loving, not that you are unlovable, but an unlovable, right. whoever that might be, right. is the purest mm-hmm. form of love for God. In God's eyes, that's what God says. doesn't matter what I think. Right. Now, you can not like it, but who gives a flip? Yeah. It's still the truth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Doesn't matter what you like. Doesn't matter if you believe it or you don't believe it. It's still the truth. It is. Praise the Lord. So you can't separate people from God. You can't say, well, I'm going to love God, but I'm going to go be a hermit because people just irritate the crap out of me. Yeah. Right? It's like the preacher said, I love church, I just don't like people. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'll join the human race. Yeah. Praise God. See, being part of a messy spiritual family helps me remember that the whole story is much bigger than me. So we come because we want something without realizing the fact that I come is because you need something. Right? And you come because I need something. Is it making sense? I mean, that's what church is. It's not... It's not how many people you can get in a building. It isn't your denomination. It's this is the way God planned it. This is the way it works. It does not work outside of this. Praise the Lord. When I live in community, when I live in the church, I'm forced to make it about the kingdom of God for everybody. And not the kingdom of God just for my benefit. Right? If I'm, if I'm isolated, it's just me, 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 me all day long. It's just what I need. But when I put myself in a group of other people, now all of a sudden I see other needs. I see, hey, maybe somebody's got an issue that's even bigger than mine. Or maybe mine isn't as significant as I thought it was. Or maybe theirs is like mine. So now I've got somebody I can link up with, somebody that I can agree with, somebody that I can say, okay, we're going to believe this. We're we're not going to let go of this. God's put us here for a reason, and that's what we're going to live by. And all of a sudden, I leave with less sense of anxiety and stress over me because I recognize this isn't just about me. It's about us. Praise the Lord. If this is really about following and becoming like Christ, Mm -hmm. then we will love His church the way He does. You can give me all the excuses you want. I don't care. I'm not angry. I'm not upset. I'm doing this with three people. I've done it with one. I've done it with my wife and my daughter and the neighbor kid that was five years old. I mean, I, I, this is just, I'm going to do it, yeah, you know. I was say. But I'm just saying, there is a way that it's supposed to work. Yes. Yeah. And if we don't follow the, those parameters that God has given us, then why should we expect that things are the way they are, right? Exactly. C.S. Lewis wrote many books. One of them, The Lion in the Wardrobe. Most of you have seen some of it on TV or something if you haven't actually read the book. But here's a quote, or here's a passage anyway from from Lion and the Wardrobe. Lion, Witch Wardrobe, I should say. (coughs) Father Christmas, Father Xmas. He meets the Pavensive children, right? And provides them with these needed things to carry out their calling as kings and queens of Narnia. I mean, you know, we are kings and queens. You know, he's using the metaphor here for everything. Amen. So he goes on to say, amen, uh, all, of the th- all the stuff you're going to need, amen, to become kings and queens, I'll provide for you. Okay, so he gives a sword to Peter. He gives a bow and arrow to Susan, a bottle of healing potion for Lucy, amen, and each uses his or her gift wisely at critical points in their subsequent battles. Mm -hmm. Amen. Their brother Edmund, he isn't there because he's been taken in by the charm of the evil white witch. And the gift that he receives from her is candy. Praise the Lord. Momentary pleasure. Instant gratification. Nothing that's actually going to prepare him as a future king. Because of his decision to leave his siblings 
to leave the community, yeah. to leave the family, the group, amen, the body, praise the Lord. His decision to do that and follow his desires, Edmund has to wait much, much, much longer to receive his true gifts. Yeah, yeah. Just read the book. I mean, that's the way it's written. And it parallels the scripture. Uh -huh. Best gifts aren't luxury items. Right. Nothing wrong with wanting them, nothing wrong with desiring, and nothing wrong with God giving them. Yeah. But they're not the priority. No, right. Best gifts aren't candy mm -hmm. or pleasures. The best gifts equip us to accomplish the tasks and the lives yes. that God has for us. Yes. Yes. So the question I ask myself is, if I look for God's blessing in my context, right, what would he give me? If I just said, God, bless me, what would, what would it be? It, it, just in my particular context, amen? Would it be wisdom? Would it be an understanding of relationships? Would it be endurance under stress? Would it be patience or grace for other people and for whatever challenges today might bring? See the difference? Because those things I usually only ask for when I'm in the middle of the fuss. Right? The rest of the time, I'm asking for something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Candy. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord, something sweet. Yeah. Something instant gratification. Something that I can say, Praise the Lord, that was God. Yeah. Matthew 25, verse 14 and 15. Matthew 25, 14 and For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. See, we have the talents. We have the gifts. He's already told us. We have the gifts of the Spirit, right? Do we use them? Or how do we use them? Because they work by faith. Moving forward and trusting is the path of truth and blessing, even if we can't see it. Right. Praise the Lord. When I bless somebody else, there's a blessing for me in it. <clears throat> may not be the one I'm thinking of, it may not, matter, but it'll be the one that I needed. Yes, it'll right. be the one that was the most important. Praise the Lord. Come follow me. It's just that simple. Remember Naaman? Remember the story of Naaman in 2 Kings? 2 Kings chapter 5, he says, he, he, he's, he's filled with leprosy. And his servant tells him that there's this uh, prophet in Israel by the name of Elijah, and he can heal you. His prayer will, will heal you. So Naaman goes to this, the king, the Syrian king, who Naaman is actually like his right-hand man. He's his aide. And he goes to the king and he says, look, is it all right if I go see this prophet in Israel? Because they're saying that he can heal me. So the king gives him the okay. And Naaman comes to Elijah. But instead of welcoming this big shot from Syria, Elijah sends out this gopher to go talk to him. And he says, you know... Uh, Elijah just said, uh, simply wash seven times in the Jordan River, and you'll be clean. Look at King, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, Suzanne. Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and far, far rivers of Damascus better than all these waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Praise the Lord. So, Jordan, the Jordan River is small and shallow, between 2 and 10 feet deep in most places during the dry season. And it's full of silt. Like you would imagine any river, when the rivers go down, the crud condenses or 
intensifies, right? The less water there is, the more silt you actually experience, praise the Lord. So look at here in verse 13 and 14 now, Suzanne. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Praise the Lord. So if Naaman had remained hung up on facts, right. praise the Lord, the river's dirty, it's smelly, Praise the Lord. And after all, Elijah didn't honor me. Guys, praying for me, didn't even, didn't even look at me, didn't even shake my hand. Didn't even act like I am somebody, right? Or how about the instructions he gave me? That was just humiliating. It's beneath my dignity to go down here into this filthy river, amen, and act like a moron. Why, you just wave your hand over me? Can't you just prophesy to me and this is, it's over, I'm good, it's all good? No. Yeah. Praise the Lord. If he had felt that way, if he had acted that way, he would have not gotten the blessing. He would have missed right. the blessing. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, we just think we've got a better idea of how God ought to bless us. Yeah, that's true. Or how it should work quicker, easier, cleaner, more straightforward, less ands, if, buts, right? We want God's blessing, but we want it on our terms. Not His. We don't want to get dirty. We don't want to take a risk. We'll take the blessing, but on our terms. God promises us blessings. He wants us to experience them. The path, however, is by necessity on his terms. John 1, 45 through 46 again. 45 and 46. We'll close up here now. Praise the Lord. Can you say that again? Yeah. Uh, 1 John, or excuse me, John 1, 45 and 46. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Find it, Philip findeth Nathanael, saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. So the paradox or the contradiction again of Nazareth is the reminder of the paradox or the contradiction of Jesus. Right? Nobody thought he was, could be the one. I mean, who is this guy? Comes from this dirty little town. Nothing. Nobody. Praise the Lord. And also the contradiction or the paradox of the kingdom as opposed to the kingdoms of this world. It just doesn't operate the way the world does. Right. You don't get to set your own course. Right. Amen. God's ways flip the ways of our natural world. And they force us to faith. Yes. They force you to use yes. faith. Yes. Praise the Lord. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. To follow Him. Yes. Just walk by faith. Yes. That's how we follow Him. Yes. We take a risk every once in a while. Amen? We love people that are not lovable. Right. We give opportunities for them. Second opportunities, third opportunities. For how many? Look, I know you might not like this. Some of it might rub some people the wrong way. But how many opportunities has God given you? And I don't care how good you've been. They have been multiple and ongoing. You say, yeah, but I never did that. Look, there isn't a red list. No. You know, there isn't a green list. Right? It's just, there they are. Yes. Gossip. Yeah. Right there with murder. Unforgiveness. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. I mean, I know some of the, we just, I'm thinking, uh, this wasn't intended to be about 
the mic thing. Okay? But I'm saying it's still there whether you want it to be that or not. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, look, if, 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 if you knew everything about me, you know, I'll be quick to say that. Never, that I never did that. I never did that thing. Yeah. Right? Because it's a, it bucks. I mean, that bothers me. It's one of those creepy things, you know? But believe me, in the eyes of God, I've done stuff just as bad. I'm, a, I'm not talking about 40 years ago. I'm talking about 24 hours ago or something, you know? I mean, come on. If my thoughts are the same as my actions in the eyes of God, oh, buddy, there isn't anything on here that I haven't done. There isn't any... Right. Nothing that I haven't committed. Right. And I'm going to stand in judgment yeah. of somebody else? Oh, no. No. Because I'm so holy? Mm. Because I'm so righteous? Or because that was so despicable? Mm. Right. See, that's what I'm saying about the body of Christ has to function yes. in agreement with the head. Yes. Otherwise, we're some kind of spastic, you know... Dysfunctional mess. And God said, without the mess, you're not a church. So I don't like messes. Well, then you should stay home. As if there weren't any mess there. But the church has always been a place where the messies go. Where the sick are. Where the screwed up, where the dysfunctional. That's what the church is for. That's why the church exists. Now, if we're only going to let the people in that are just like me, that act like me, that like the things I like, that do the things I do, then it's not a church. It's a get-together. That's right. That's right. Praise the Lord. We've had our share over the years, I'm, I'm not talking about just this particular church, but I'm talking about over the years from the time that we got into the ministry. Yeah. The first thing my pastor did was give me people that were involved with incest. I'm telling you, some of the most despicable. One little girl, her dad shot her mother while her mother was holding her in her lap. And the dad shot her in her head and splattered her brains all over this little kid. This kid was filled yes. with issues. Yeah. And she's wanting to get married. And the pastor sent me to do the counseling for their prenups. Yeah. Now I'm telling you, it was like a nightmare. It was a horror show. It, it, got, it upset me so much, I couldn't hardly talk. I mean, I'm thinking, who, who does these things? Yeah. And now they're in the church? Yeah. I mean, I, there was times when I thought, man, I, I should have just went into psychiatry. <laughs> Because this is too much for God. You know what I mean? I mean, this is just, they're just too messed up. They're, they're, I don't know, you know. And God is saying, that's who I died for. And you can't give them the benefit of forgiveness? Because you don't like what they did, or they offended you, or they offended somebody close to you? Hey. Tough. You... I'm telling you, the people that think that way, you are going to get one shock yes. when you get to heaven. God is not going to be like you think He is. I'm not saying He's not loving and forgiving. and I'm saying He's all that, but He's so much more. And He's trying to stretch us beyond our humanity, beyond our emotions, beyond our feelings. He's trying to get us to the place where we operate by the Spirit and we don't let our intellect... Keep us from being the spirit people that we're supposed to be. And if you want to know why we don't see the healings and the deliverance and the prosperity that we're praying for, it's because all this other crap yep. is in the way. Yes. And we make it about me yes. instead of about us. Right. Yes. Right? I mean, you look at the book of Acts. They had the greatest miracles, the most extravagant moves of God. And what? They found everything common. I'm not interested in turning us into a communist group. And I'm not asking for your money every day or to give it to some. I'm just saying, this is, he was giving us a picture of what the church looks like. Somebody has a need, I want to help them. 
Now, I may not have the money to just pay off their whatever the thing is, but I might be able to fix a meal for them. I might be able to do this for them. I might be able to mow their grass or do whatever it might be that I could contribute. Or it might just be I could say, you know what, brother, I love you. You're a screw up, but I love you anyway because you remind me of me. I mean, think about it. Where else are people going to go and find acceptance and forgiveness and forgiveness, I should say, in this world where the world just wants you to conform to their plan and their... Per Look, I mean, come on, geez, I think about some of this stuff is so, so stupid, so disconnected. We, we want to we want to kill babies when they're born. Find no fault with it whatsoever. It's absolutely okay. The government says it's okay. The, the majority of the intellectuals think it is absolutely the thing to do. And yet, we're going to arrest somebody for rubbing on a little girl. I'm not saying they shouldn't be arrested. Or boy, whatever it might be. I'm not saying they shouldn't be arrested. I'm just saying we're going to make that when this is going on. I'm not saying it isn't wrong and that we should accept it. No. I'm just saying there's crap happening everywhere all around us that's being said, it's okay, it's, it's all right. Why? Why is it okay and why is it all right? Because somebody said so. God didn't, just somebody said it. So I'm not interested in somebody's opinion. I'm interested in what God has said because that's the only thing that's going to change the world that we're living in. Praise the Lord. And the only way it can happen based on what God has said is through the church. Yeah. It won't happen out there. I don't care how many rules we come up with. I don't care how many laws we pass. If the laws would change it, we wouldn't have the stuff that we have right now. Because the law has been on the books for most of this stuff for 100 years or more. So it's not like it's something new. But the church, God has identified the church as the means by which... He brings His Spirit into this dimension. Yes. Healings, deliverance, prosperity. Uh, yes. pro you know, prophecies. All the things that we have need of. Yes. To have our direction made clearer to us. Yes. They come from here. They come from you. Yes. Not me, not just me. From us, from the church. That's why we do the things we do. And I know people come and they think, oh, come on, get past this. Let's get to the singing or let's get to the preaching. That stuff is happening is as important, if not more important, than anything else that takes place in the service. Because it's the body functioning the way the body is supposed to function. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can anything good come out of the east side of Des Moines? Yes. Praise the Lord, that little rat hole. I mean, you can, from there you can see the Capitol on a clear day. But let me ask you this. Would you rather put your trust in the people in that Capitol or the people in this church? If you're asking me, it's a given. I'll, I'll risk your choices. I'll risk your decisions before I will somebody who has their own agenda and I'm not any part of it other than just being in the way. Praise the Lord. This is the body. He's the head. And if you don't want to work with the head, praise the Lord. You either atrophy or you get cut off before gangrene sets in. Praise the Lord. I'm not, you know, look, I believe in the love of God. I believe in the grace of God. Yes. I'm not flipping my belief system here. I'm just saying there are some things that we just let fly yeah. and think it's okay. It's not okay. We have, if you want to be like Jesus, you're not going to be like, you can't be like Jesus by first stepping out and laying hands on the sick and expecting everybody to get healed. Because long before Jesus ever healed anybody, he loved everybody. Yeah. He sent His Son into this world, not to judge this world, not to condemn the world, but to set Him free. Yes. And if we are that body, that is our responsibility. Yes. Leave the judgment to God. Yes. He's the only one that has a right to it. Praise the Lord. 
I love that because it frees me up to be the idiot that I am without yeah. feeling guilty about it. Right. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I'm thinking in the future, days, weeks, months, God's putting some stuff out there for us. And he's saying, are you serious about this? Yes. Or do you just want to be, you know, another sign on a building somewhere? Yeah. Or do you really want to be a church? Do you really want to be the body of Christ? Do you really want to see God operate through you? Amen. And he can do it. He doesn't need 500 people. He can do it with 50. He can do it with 20. He can do it with 10. He could do it with three. Praise the Lord. If they know what it is they're there for. Hallelujah. God bless all of you. Have a great week. It's going to be beautiful. It looks like the rest of the day, or at least part of it, should be nice. Get out there and enjoy some sun and fresh air. Be happy. Don't worry. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.